Good morning, everybody. Good to see everyone on this Lord's Day. I, uh, Larissa and I, we came back from Virginia and uh, spent the last Sunday down there. We missed you guys, but it's good to be back here and, and uh, be with you all and, and to good to see everyone. We have some new faces. Hello, my name is uh, John Zwingle and uh, I'm the uh, interim pastor here with the church and and uh, Lord's blessed me to allow to be part of this church family that we've grown to love. And, and uh, as we take our Bibles, we're going to be going to Philippians chapter 1 um, as, as we continue on through the book of Philippians. Uh, we'll do the expository preaching verse by verse at a time and, and digging the truths of God's word for our very lives and so that we can be drawn closer into and be conformed into the image of our Son, or of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Philippians chapter 1, we continue on with Paul's greeting uh, to the Philippians church. Now, I want to encourage you, uh, if you would like to uh, listen to the prior sermons on Philippians, you can go to YouTube. I believe it's on YouTube. Or the church website maybe has them posted there as well. And you can start off in verse 1. And there's a few other sermons before then. But uh, we're going to make our way, Lord willing, through the entire book of Philippians. And I don't know about you, but I've been blessed by it, uh, just uh, for the study of it, and to learn these, these truths from God's Word. And so we'll be in chapter 1, starting in verse 1, and that is not going to be our main text. Our main text will be found in verses 7 and 8. But uh, let's uh, read verses 1 and go from there. The Apostle Paul writes, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayers with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I am sure of this, that he who has begun a good work in you will, or will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, praise your wonderful holy name, our God. Lord, first and foremost, above all things, Lord, we praise you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, dear Lord Jesus, for being our Savior. You are our Savior. You have gone to the cross of Calvary to die for our sins. And Lord, you have taken the wrath of God the Father upon yourself in our stead. And Lord, now you have ascended on high and now seated at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for your people. Lord, we gather together, Lord, because we love you. As we mentioned in Sunday school, Lord, it's not because we first loved you because we haven't. It is because you first have loved us by giving your son for us. And Lord, because we have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb, we have been forgiven of our sins and our names now written in the book of life. Lord, we come together as a redeemed people loving you we hunger and thirst for righteousness. And Lord, I ask of you, Father, that as we open up the book, that, Lord, we would hear from heaven today. Feed us, dear God, by your Holy Spirit. Give us all wisdom, dear Lord. Open our ears to hear and open our eyes to see. So, Lord, that we can be conformed into the image of your dear Son, loving you, and worshiping you in every aspect of our life. Lord, help us. You know every person here. You know our frame. You know that we are but dust. 
And Lord, you are eternal. And we praise you. As broken vessels coming before you, Lord, and being made whole in the image of Christ, help us, Lord. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, just a, a reminder of what we've gone through. We've seen in verse 1 that Paul is identifying himself of, of who he is uh, by saying him and Timothy are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're, they're bond slaves to the Lord. They have been adopted into Christ and now are, are serving him. And, and that's what a true child of God is. They are a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. As, and Mary was that same uh, as a young lady. She, when she was confronted by the angel uh, and told of the Holy Spirit that, that she would conceive the Lord Jesus Christ, she too said, I am your servant and I will listen and adhere to the word of God. But then Paul also goes on to give identification that we are saints in Christ Jesus. And this is a title given to God's people. Those who are truly redeemed by the blood of Christ, we are saints. We are, have been purchased by the blood of Christ. And it's not something that we slap our, back, our, our hand on our back about. It's something that we don't sit there and give ourselves title about. It's what the Lord calls us. And of course, the church at Philippi, he created his local church so that the local church can come together. Those people at Philippi are redeemed saints, just like here in Denville, they're redeemed saints as we are. And within our congregation, there are the overseers and deacons, the, the, the men who, who serve in, uh, in the church and the, the people who, who teach the word of God to preach the word of God for the protection and edification of God's people. And of course, this has all come about, as he says in verse 2, grace to you. It is because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that we have been saved and of course, once we have the grace of God and his salvation, we also now have peace for, with God. And this is Paul's short introduction, but he doesn't stop there. You see, verses 1 through 11 is Paul's continued uh, introduction of his letter to the church at Philippi. And we're about halfway through. And as we go on in verse, one, uh, verse 3, he continues and saying, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Paul was a thankful man. Now, where was Paul at this time? He wrote this letter as a prisoner in Rome. He had been preaching the gospel there, and as a result, uh, he suffered persecution for his preaching of Christ and was thrown in prison. And uh, he, when he was uh, told of the state of the Philippians, uh, he remembers to write them and say, I thank God. I remember you, and I thank God for you. Now, Paul was the uh, evangelist who went to Philippi on his, secondary, on his second missionary trip. The Philippian church is the first church in Europe to be created. Uh, yes, there was other churches that started, but this is the first European church. We have Lydia, uh, the woman who uh, uh, was a, a woman that uh, met uh, Paul down on the riverside and, and God opened her heart. We know the Philippian jailer. We know the demon-possessed woman uh, who came to know Christ and the household of those individuals when you read cha uh, Acts chapter 16. So we see that Paul does remember these people and they're very much uh, in his heart and he says in verse 4, Always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy. And that is the theme of Philippians. It's the letter of joy. Uh, Paul's remembrance of this church was a joyous remembrance. You know, it wasn't like he was right in the Philippians where, you know, there was a lot of contention. There was a lot of false teaching. Uh, he couldn't really honestly say, I'm writing you guys with joy in my heart because you're walking with the Lord in such a great way. No, he is writing to this church because, first of all, it's the church that first started in Europe. And these people have great testimonies that they are partnering with him in the furtherance of the gospel. As he continues on to say, 
because of your verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. For the first time that they heard of the Lord Jesus Christ and their still continued propagation of the gospel, even while Paul is still in Rome, they are still an evangelizing church. And Paul would go on to say in verse 6, And I am sure of this, what? Going back to verse 5, the gospel. He's sure of this. The gospel, that is when life began. He says of this, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you. When was that beginning of that work? When they heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, repented and put their faith in Christ. This is the beginning of the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And he continues on, he says, He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And so the, that is the work of growing in, in the Lord Jesus. Even throughout all these years later, and Paul is writing, I am confident in God that God is working in your heart and transforming you and shaping you into the image of his son. And that's a confidence that we ought to have one for another is that the Lord is doing the work. And so now as we get to the main text, verse 7 and 8, Paul continues on, on that thought of that which is good. I am confident of this thing, that he that has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he says in verse 7, it is right for me to feel this way. And that's where we'll park, uh, or, uh, we'll, we'll park a little bit and, and uh, go into. Now, when Paul writes this, he's, he wrote probably one of the most famous verses in the Bible, and that's verse 6. Uh, you know, uh, and this is a, verse 6 is a very confident uh, verse for us to, to know that God is doing a work because it teaches great theology within it. Because in verse 6, he says that he, who is he? That is God. God is who he is. He's all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He's omniscient. He is God, and he's right. And what he's doing is he says, he who began a good work. So God is doing his will. He's doing his work. And then Paul continues on with the character of God by saying, and he will complete his work. Isn't it wonderful to know that we have a God who is all-powerful, who does the work in our lives, and he's able to complete his work, meaning he's faithful to his will, isn't he? So I'm, I'm thankful in the Lord that God is faithful to his purpose, to his being. And uh, whereas we drop the ball all the time, don't we? We have sometimes difficulty trusting other people uh, because, well, well, we're just sinners. We're not true all the time. We we uh, we're 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 uh, selfish by nature. Uh, we sometimes don't want to do the things for other people, and and you know that's that's our our nature. That's who we are. But God is not that way. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God that He is faithful to Himself. He's faithful to His will, and He will complete it uh, until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul says, it is right for me to feel this way. So Paul has the confidence uh, to know. So here is point one, starting in verse seven, that the gospel, going all the way back to, to verse five, because of your partnership in what? The gospel. The gospel is the beginning of, of eternal life. But remember that when Paul says in verse six that he began a good work in you and will complete it, that means that not only did he save you, but he's going to make you into a better husband. He's going to make you into a better a woman, a better, a, better, a better son, a better daughter, a better grandparent. Uh, the Lord is going to work in his gospel uh, to conform you. Why? Because we, when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's just not a belief in, okay, then Jesus fits in our back pocket and we just pull him out whenever we need him. No, Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, Christ, who is our life. That means the heartbeat. He is the source 
to every manner of life to which we live. Isn't it, isn't it nice to know that you can go to work and go to work as if you're working for Christ himself? You're working for the Lord. Well, the paycheck comes from IBM. Yeah, but that IBM funds comes from God. Everything that you have, everything that we live by is by the Lord. And for the believer, our life came to know this one true living God by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And herein now we live by Christ because of, of his, the life that he's given for us. You know, I'm not a, uh, uh, I could never be a good husband if it were not for Jesus. I mean, I could not live for the Lord Jesus Christ if it were not for his death, burial, and resurrection in his salvation for saving my soul. And that goes for everyone. Paul is saying that to the Philippians. I feel confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perform it, will complete it until the day of his son. And it's right for me to feel this way. As he says in verse 7, so the gospel is the joyful, uh, it, the gospel is joyful to the thought of the thought life of the believer and to the church. Notice he says, it is right for me to feel. Uh, it also, it, it, it means this, to think this way. Uh, in the original language, it would mean this. The definition is to have a specific mental attitude. And this attitude was joyful because of God working in others. And the Apostle Paul rejoiced knowing that God is working in others. Now, are you thankful that the Lord has helped you? Are you thankful, first of all, for Jesus Christ? And see, that's the sum of life at all. You know, like in Sunday school, we talked about, well, we want to start evangelizing. We want to help other people. We must remember Christ in all things. Remember him. He is the source and he is the life. And he is the one who's able to give us the strength and the power to continue on by the Holy Spirit. And Paul is encouraging these brothers by saying, I, it's right for me to feel this way about, it's right for me to think this, that he, God, is doing a work in your very life while I'm in prison. I still think it's a great thing. Could the Philippian church think that about Paul? And we'll look at that in a moment. And I believe they very much do. So, do you hold others in your heart as Paul would write? You see that Paul holds them in his heart in verse 7. It is right for me to feel this way because I hold you in my heart. That holding is just something that is, is being uh, in a, in a uh, you know, when you hug somebody, you're embracing them. It's not just holding it like, you know, like you hold the, I'm holding my glasses like this. No, the holding to which he is mean is an embracing, a, a taking into and cherishing. And he says, and I hold you in my heart. And this is an expression of the inwards of, of Paul. Hey, so close to me. Do you hold people in your heart? As a church, a church should hold one another. Uh, I know that some churches can get so big that maybe you don't know other people. Well, we ought to get to know one another. We, because we can get cliquish. We can get uh, in our little clicky groups and, and not really expand outward from that. It happens. It's our, it's our nature that we do it that way. But the Lord was never that way, was he? He went out among sinners, didn't he? He was a friend of sinners. Never sinned. He can't. He's God. But yet he came to save sinners. Uh, Paul says, and I am the utmost of all of them. Well, that's where I kind of argue with Paul a little bit. Uh, brother, I'm in competition with you there. Well, we see that the Paul is writing to them from prison. And he says, I hold you in my heart. I am bracing you and I am thankful for God, what he is doing to you. And it's right for me to think this way. And what does that say for us as a church? For one another is that if there are certain people who are uh, 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 maybe we don't know well or we don't uh, understand, whatever it is, it is our responsibility to move into the heart attitude to what Paul had. 
for those people at, at the Philippian church is for us to embrace one another so much that it's in our heart. So when someone is in your heart, the remembrance of them brings joy. Well, in that remembrance of them is also a time of when they hurt, what are we doing? We're also going to help them in that need as well, aren't we? And Paul exemplified that quite well, but the utmost example for, uh, example for uh, attitude is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And of course, when we read... Uh, uh, um, he says, uh, you are, uh, uh, let's continue on. He says, it is right for me to feel this way because I hold you in my heart. And then he goes on and he says, for you are all partakers with me of grace. So when we are, are all partakers of grace, they both knew, that is the Philippian church and Paul, they both knew that they had been saved by the grace of God. My dear friends, I want to ask you, do you know what grace is? Grace is, well, the biblical term of grace would be the unmerited favor of God toward you. The unmerited favor, meaning you had nothing to do with it. God has found favor with you in spite of you, but it's because of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved. Through faith, And so I like the psalm that uh, so to understand what grace is and know that it is unmerited favor of God towards men. Please understand that grace is the source or the source of grace is from God. As it says in Psalm 84, 11, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk, uh, who walk uprightly. So we see that the Lord bestows favor and honor. This is his grace upon those. And he says he does not withhold uh, uh, the goodness of him, uh, of him upon those who walk with him. Grace is of God. And also the Bible says that it came by the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to these verses. For the law in John 1, 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Paul would write to the Romans, but the free gift is not like, uh, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one's man's trans uh, trespass, meaning Adam, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by grace that one man, Christ Jesus, abounded for many. So we see that though man dies in their sin because of Adam, we yet are given grace and the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul would continue to write in 1 Corinthians 1.4, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus. So we ought to be a thankful people, as Paul is thankful, that we are partakers, as he says, together in the grace of Almighty God. And it says in, in uh, uh, Ephesians, uh, starting in verse 2, or Ephesians 2, starting in verse 5, that grace is, by, uh, uh, by, is found in salvation. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, Made alive, alive, uh, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. That is, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And praise the Lord for the grace of God that we are not deserving of it, but because of his son and his love for his people, he gave himself for us that we can be inheritors of his grace. 
And so Paul is saying, because I hold you dear in my heart, you are so close to me, and I thank God for you. Why? It's all because of the cross of Christ and his grace by saving us. And God's work in, is being completed by grace. Remember what we just read in verse 5, uh, in verse 6. I am sure of this thing, that he began a good work in you, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Paul tells the Thessalonians in different wordage, but the teaching is the same. Uh, listen to what he says here. To this end, we always pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Though Paul does use different verbiage, the teaching is identical to what he says to the Philippians in verse 6. So we see the unity within this. Grace is God working, and, is, and God's working is completed by his grace. Grace is necessary for the believer to serve God. We need the, the grace of God enabled to serve him, don't we? We need his wisdom, we need his power, we need, we need the Lord completely, all of him, and we need his grace. Listen to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and, let us, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. That's a grace that we have been received that now we are able to worship him. We're able to worship him in spirit and in truth with reverence and awe. And we have been inherited a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And of course, it's only by the grace of God that we are able to worship him in spirit and in truth. But now as we move on in verse 7 to the, part, the, to the later half, he says, Let's read the verse part again. For it is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers of me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Now this is an interesting statement. Paul mentions his imprisonment. Now when we think of prisoners, we think of people, men and women, who are locked up for a reason. Well, Paul was an innocent man. He was an innocent man. He broke no law. The only thing that he was guilty of was preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the law or the gospel is an offense to man. And man can't stand to be heard that they are sinners and they are needing salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul is in prison at this time. Notice that he says imprisonment. Now, society looks down on prisoners. When we think about that, I, I had a prison ministry when I was living up in Vermont. Uh, we had a prison ministry, and we visited the men in that prison, and they all had uh, are, are accused of committing all different types of crimes. And, uh, you know, you could feel that there was a sense of tension in the air when you go in there. But there was one thing that would that would bring peace to, to, to that congregation or that, that meeting of men in there is that when we began to bring the word of God, God began to calm their hearts. And God began to open their hearts to know that they needed Jesus Christ. Yes, there was people who had opposition against it. That comes with the scene. Uh, you know, there's nothing new about that. But then we had seen men come to know the Lord Jesus Christ during that time. Paul is using this moment as a prisoner to make sure that he is going to remain that salt and that light in the earth. He knew that in prison he would be able to reach the prisoners. He would be able to reach those uh, 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 people like the jailer he did in, in Philippi. Remember, when you read Acts chapter 18, uh, 16, you remember Paul ended up leading. He was in jail in Philippi too for preaching. And he ended up getting in jail. And while he was there, the Lord ended up leading him 
uh, to to uh, witness to the to the jailer, to the man who kept the, the bars closed. And the jailer is now part of this congregation to which he is writing and thanking my God for you. And so it is wonderful to know that even Paul is still continuing saying, I'm in my bonds, in my imprisonment. Paul still would continue to shine as a light. And you know what encouraged him? That church at Philippi. When he wrote that letter, he did not write a letter of woe is me. You know, I need this, need, uh, pray for this, this, and this. It's something I need. Paul never mentioned anything at all about it. Paul is writing a letter, and his letter is, I thank God when I remember you guys. And I thank God is doing a work in you to this very day. Can you imagine a Christian saying something like that? When we have troubles in our life, we lose our job, we have people sick, uh, maybe there's death, whatever it is. And yes, there, uh, according to Ecclesi Ecclesiastes chapter 3, there's a season uh, to every aspect of life. There's a time to laugh, there's a time to cry. There are those issues that God allows us to go through. The difference is, is Christ being known. Does Christ allow you to be, uh, does Christ uh, being seen when he allows you to lose employment? When he allows you to have family die? When he allows you, the children to get sick on the brink of, get, of death? Exper experienced all of those. Is Christ being made known? And here's the Apostle Paul who is, well, as we know when you read his biography, uh, his life uh, history, you see that man, he was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was whipped, he was, uh, he, he was stoned, he was, I mean, this guy was a, an outcast of outcasts, and yet he lived and loved the Lord Jesus Christ, and from prison he writes, I thank God for you. No woe is me, so how does that fit into our very life? But then he goes on and he uses a couple more words, my dear friends, in verse 7. He says, he, says, uh, um, he says, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. The gospel is the root. The gospel is the foundation to our life. And he's saying it, the, uh, some interesting words in defense of it. Uh, this word is uh, used only a few times in the scriptures. Paul would use it in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, when he is uh, making a, a defense of, of himself by preaching the gospel. But this word, at its root meaning, means apologetics. That means to make in a defense of the faith. You know, when I was in seminary, one of my classes was uh, apologetics. And basically, apologetics is kind of learning about uh, Mormonism. You learn about the Jehovah Witnesses. You learn about Christian science. You learn, you learn about them and their fallacies and their history. You learn about them so that you're able to go and talk to them and win them to Christ. You're able to understand their side of the viewpoint and in that be a proclamation of the gospel. And so we see that Paul is using this term is that defense means apologetic. It means to, to have a, a, a legal term being used to, to defend the word. But then he says confirmation. This is meaning guarantee, a verifying of the word. This church, this Philippian church, partook with Paul in living a grace-filled life. That is well found in verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel. These dear folks lived a life that verified the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. These people lived a life that showed a guarantee that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. These people lived a life bringing glory and honor to praise to him. These people lived a life in verse 6, knowing that God is doing a good work in them until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. But now Paul moves on to verse 8, where he says, For God is my witness, how I, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. So Paul had a joyful attitude along with them. 
He made himself uh, identifiable with them. He had an attitude of like them, and he, he made an alliance uh, with, him, uh, with them in the Lord Jesus, which moves us to verse 8, that the deep love of the Lord Jesus Christ is an affection for the Lord and for his people. You know, he says uh, in verse 8, he says, For God is my witness. Here is Paul calling on God to testify or be the witness that he is utmost telling the truth. It's not a blasphemous term that is used by people of this day. It's, it's not using God's name in vain. No, before Almighty God, my Savior, my God, my King, my Lord, the Lord knows my heart. And, and when we speak, my dear friends, we ought to have of that very same attitude that the words I speak, God is my witness, what I tell you is of the truth. And how I live is of, of Him. He is my witness. And then Paul goes on to say, how I yearn for you. This yearning is a deep compassion. This yearning is, is something that comes within himself. Yes, I, I want to hold you in my heart, and I do hold you, but also within that holding is that yearning, that desire to be with them. He says, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. These are a local group of people, and Paul is yearning to be with them also. He loves them so greatly. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. That's what we read about earlier, isn't it? Isn't it? That he is a faithful God. He's faithful to do his work, to begin a work and finish it to the end. In verse 24, he would say, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Do you see the unity between the parallelism between that verse and that verse that we read about, he that has begun a good work in you? That we would stir one another up onto good works? That's encouraging one another, isn't it? If you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit living within you. You have the ability to do things that are pleasing to God to which you were not able to do before. Maybe you have a gift of evangelizing. Maybe you have a gift of administration. Maybe you're a good teacher in the Lord. Whatever it is, you are to use and expound your gifts for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, encouraging one another, as what the writer of Hebrew would say, stir one another up, encourage, fan the flames, is another way to express this. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. In verse 25, and not neglecting to meet together as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Here is Paul using uh, the same verbiage of him yearning to be with these dear people. Now, as Brother Tom had mentioned earlier, that the, this live streaming uh, has to come to an end. And I agree with that. I, and in fact, I'm a firm believer that every church should not be live streaming anymore. Uh, that COVID uh, that the Lord brought along, uh, you know, I think some people have gone astray and they don't go and ch be with church people. The, you know, the Lord wants us to be together. Even Paul even expresses it. I yearn to be among you. I yearn to be with you, with the affections of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here I think it's only proper uh, for us as a church to, you know, if you want to listen to sermons, yeah, you can go to YouTube or anything like that. But for a church, what is it? We stir one another up by being with one another. You know, when we're together, we serve together as a local body of believers, don't we? And this is what Paul is saying in this text, that God began a good work in you in Philippi. He saved you. You're now propagators of the gospel because you now live in the gospel. And now that you live in his gospel, you're able, he's able to conform you and, and to sanctify you into Lord Jesus Christ day by day by submitting yourself unto the word of God. 
And here Paul is now writing and says, man, when I, thank you, when I think of you, I thank God for every second of you and every ounce of you. Why? Because of Christ. Because of who he is. For God is my witness, he, he says. One reason believers lose their joy, and this is my question, is that a lot of people, for, and it's not only this church. You know, I've been in other churches uh, uh, around and there seems to be the the nature of man that when you get away from the congregation when you get away and you start focusing on your computer and looking for a sermon on the computer on Sunday morning something happens to those people now you miss out on the congregation you miss out on the fellowship you miss out on the handshakes and the neck hugs and and you miss out on the special times of having personal prayer with one another there is a very vast difference between electronic and actually physically being with one another and one reason why i believe uh, believers lose their joy is that they become become more focused on circumstances you become dissatisfied with life. Well, I think COVID had something to do with that. I believe that the COVID brought by the Lord as a judgment upon all the world, and as a result, he is purging his church. I believe that those who are true followers of the Lord Jesus Christ will not forsake the assembly of the believers. And that's what we just read in Hebrews 25. Do not neglect to meet together. So that when the congregation agrees that we're going to meet every Lord's Day, we will make our desire to make sure that all things, whatever circumstances that we live in, with a job or without a job, we will be with our brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that this is something that Paul yearned for these people. I yearn to be with you in the, uh, in the Lord. And so we see that people... Uh, uh, lose their joy. I'm convinced of it, that those that lose their joy in the Lord is because of their focus on circumstances that may arise. Unhappy with physical or mental capabilities, opportunities lost, with an attitude of, you des I deserve what is always best, but now I guess I lose out. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not, not as the world gives you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let your hearts, let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Let me read that again. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Whose peace? God's peace. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. We read in uh, Philippians chapter 4, I'll turn there briefly, in verses 11 through 13, Paul echoes those very same things. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share your trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Paul learned to be content. Paul learned to know that, that there is a contentment to which he were to live by. And when he uses the word affections, he uses the word in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is our author and finisher of our faith. Here is the example of examples. Here is God, our Prince of Peace, our King of Kings. And he has died for us, his people, shedding his cross or shedding his blood on the cross of Calvary so that we may have eternal life. And with that affection, Paul shares and embraces that affection towards the church. When Paul says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, it's a sacrificial love. It's not, in, uh, it's not by, by selfish ambition whatsoever. No, his affection is that he died for it. 
his affection is that he holds it and embraces it, cherishes it, holding it close to him. And no man is able to pluck us from the Father's hand. His joy, remember in Hebrews chapter 12, I'll, I'll turn there very briefly, but in Hebrews chapter 12, we must remember the joy of Jesus Christ. You see, Paul writes this letter with joy in his heart, and it's just not an empty joy. It's a joy that has a purpose to everything to which he lives by. And in Hebrews chapter 12, we remember verses 1 and 2, and listen as it speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ and the joy that was set before him. As the writer of Hebrews writes to the believers, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run a race with endurance, the race that is set before us. And you know, my dear friends, with that idea, is that, again, that verse 6, I am confident, I am sure of this thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it, will complete it. And here it is, this writer also writes this, that life is a race, and in that race we have been given a, given a goal, that God is working in our very hearts. So let's endure, let us run the race with endurance, the race that is set before us. And verse 2, looking to Jesus, looking to our founder, looking to the perfecter of our faith, looking to the Son of the living God, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. My dear friends, the joy to which the Apostle Paul had is the same joy to which the Lord Jesus Christ had when he knew he was going to the cross of Calvary. The cross of Calvary is a place of torment. It's a place of torture. It's the place where the wrath of Almighty God was poured out upon his Son. It is the place of the substitutionary death of Christ in our stead. He is the Lamb of God, and yet... In joy in his heart, he knew the outcome of his death. He knew the outcome of his, of his burial. He knew the outcome of his resurrection. He knew the outcome of his ascension. And my dear friends, we could stand here today and say, I thank the Lord for the joy that was set before him, enduring the cross for me. Paul yearned for the church. He embraced it and held it dearly close to him because he remembered it's founded upon the gospel of Christ. And where the gospel of Christ is, is the beginning of eternal life. We as a church family always must look to Jesus, our author and our finisher of our faith. And so that we can be confident and say it is a good thing and it is the right thing for me to think that God is not only working in my heart to be a better man and better woman and better employee or employer, a better mom, better dad, better child. It's all Jesus in my life. He is my life. And it is right for me to think that. I hold you in my heart and I embrace you and I yearn to be with you. You want to be in the fellowship of God's people you come to church when we, when we gather. We don't forsake it. Why? We yearn for it. We hunger for it. Because Christ yearns for his people. He wants us to fellowship. He wants us to gather together, to stir one another up onto good works, to bring honor and glory and praise to him and to him alone. Praise be to the Lord Jesus Christ this day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. I thank you, dear God, for the listeners of your word, for all the souls that are here today, O oh God. I pray that your Holy Spirit has spoken and is continuing to speak. Lord, that even when we leave this building, your Holy Spirit continues his work in our heart. Lord, we love you because we, you first have loved us. 
and giving yourself for us. Praise you, Mark God and King. In Jesus' name, amen.